What is up amigos? Today we're talking about how to calculate compressible flows and velocities. And this is quite different to regular subsonic and compressible flow velocity calculations. And the reason why is because when we start to increase the velocity of our fluid, it starts to become compressible. And that means that density changes and we can even get shock waves forming. And shock waves are very, in, in, uh, is very anisotropic as we'll cover in a second what that means. But first of all, we'll go through what subsonic and compressible flow means and how to calculate the velocity there because that is very simple. So first of all, let's say we have a velocity of our flow. It's below about Mach zero, oh, sorry, Mach less than 0 0.3. This is about the general rule of thumb as to when the velocity is below this, then we say that the flow is incompressible. And obviously it is subsonic because it is below sonic speeds. So when we have a flow like this, it's very easy to calculate the velocity. All we do is we put something called a pitostatic tube into the flow. And if you don't know what this is, check out this video here, which we go through describing what it does. And then we measure the static and total pressures, and then we get the dynamic pressure out of this. Uh, P dyne equals half rho V squared. Then we can just rearrange this equation to find out what the velocity is in the flow. That's very simple. Now, when we go to subsonic, in, subsonic compressible flows, this means that we are still below Mach 1, but now we are above Mach 0 0.3. And let's say equal to or, or above, it doesn't make much of a difference, but below or uh, below and equal to or above or above equal to it's pretty much the same thing so we can still use the pitostatic tube in this situation because we can still measure the total pressure and the static pressure and the great thing is because we don't have any shocks forming the flow is what's called isentropic so isentropic centropic what this means is from a thermodynamic point of view is that as the flow goes along and it decelerates or accelerates there is no heat transfer, there's no heat loss. What that means is that this process of deceleration or acceleration is completely reversible, technically speaking. So that means that we can use this equation to find the velocity from the Mach number. So Mach number squared equals, I'll write this out and then explain the terms as we, after I've finished here. P01, P1, uh, this is to the power of gamma minus one divided by gamma minus one, and the bracket like this. So in this equation, what we have is the Mach number squared equals two divided by the specific heat ratio, minus one, and then the big bracket here, the total pressure divided by the static pressure, so that's total pressure from this pitot part and then the static pressure from the um, static holes there, to the power of the uh, specific heat ratio, minus one, divided by the specific heat ratio, ratio, minus one. So in this equation, gamma, is generally about 1.4 for air. And this ranges between about 1.3991 and 1.403, depending on the temperature of the air. And the, the uh, gamma here we have, Mach number is the Mach number, and then we've covered these pressures here. Now, in order to calculate what the actual velocity is, we just need to know what the Mach number is in terms of um, like the speed of sound. So the speed of sound A equals gamma RT, square rooted. So in this, gamma is again 1.4 approximately. R is the um, gas constant, which is for air, 287.05 approximately. This changes again, depending on the humidity in the air, but this is for dry air, 27.05 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And T is just the temperature in Kelvins. So if we know what the, the speed of sound is, and we know what the um, Mach number is for this flow, we can then just quickly calculate what the velocity is, the resulting velocity. Now that is for a subsonic compressible flow. What happens when we go to supersonic compressible flow now? This becomes a lot more difficult to do. So let's say we have the exact same pitostatic tube, which we can use to calculate the velocity again, but we have to go through a few more steps. So the reason why is because we have the flow coming along here. And let's say the Mach number is two, whatever. It doesn't really matter as long as it's above one. And as it comes along, it's going to now form a shock on this pitostatic tube because first of all, there's an object here and also it's usually pretty blunt. So the, the um, shock wave is quite strong as well anyway. And the angle, it changes depending on the sharpness of this pitot tube. Anyway, the important point to note is that there is a shock wave here. That means that as the flow comes along through the shock wave, it actually reduces in pressure and this happens um, anisotropically. So it's not isentropic anymore. What that means is that there is this heat transfer occurring through this shock. And that means that this flow is not reversible from a thermodynamic point of view. 
So that means that we can't use this type of equation anymore. The good news is though, we can still actually calculate the velocity fairly easily, as long as we know what the static pressure is in this region here, which we will call P1, and we know what the total pressure is calculated through this pitot tube. So the total pressure in front of the shock wave, we denote as P01, afterwards it's P02, and the static pressure uh, in front of the shock wave is P1, static pressure behind the shock wave is P2. So we can calculate P02 quite easily with this pitot-static tube, but that's what we will measure if we put this in. We can't actually calculate, we can't actually, sorry, measure the um, static pressure, the dynamic pressure, the total pressure, sorry. <laughs> A lot of pressure is going around. We can't actually calculate the total pressure ahead of the shock wave um, with this pitot-static tube. We have to use uh, another method just using mathematics, but that's fine. We don't actually need to know that for this uh, upcoming um, equation that we can use to calculate what the velocity is. So to calculate the velocity of this air, let's say we didn't actually know what this was, it could be anything, um, but we know that it's supersonic. So what we can do is we say P02, again, I'm gonna write this out and then I'll explain exactly what everything means as at the end. I just wanna make sure that I write this out uh, accurately so that I don't miss any little parts because is, it is fairly uh, big, this equation. Four gamma M2 minus two gamma minus one uh, to the power of gamma on gamma minus one. And then this is one minus gamma plus two gamma M2 divided by gamma plus one. Let me just quickly make sure this is correct. Yes, all good. Okay, so if we calculate, if we measure the static pressure ahead of the shock wave, we then measure the total pressure behind the shock wave, P02. We can then calculate what the Mach number is upstream of the shock wave just by knowing what the um, specific heat ratio is as well, which we know is 1.4 approximately, and it changes depending on the temperature from 1.3991 to 1.403. And we can then just rearrange this to find out what the Mach number is. And if we know what the speed of sound is, which we have here, we can calculate what the speed is actually in terms of meters per second or feet per second or whatever you want to use. So that is how to calculate the velocity of the flow in incompressible first of all, then compressible subsonic and compressible supersonic flows. So if you like this video, make sure to like it and click the subscribe button. And I'll see you if you go. Peace, amigos.